Um, so some of you may have gotten a paper quiz tonight. That was to help test your knowledge, but we're also gonna make this presentation a little bit interactive. And to do that, all you need to do is pull out your smartphone and go to your browser <laughs> and type in www.menti.com. That's M-E-N-T-I. And I'll go to you. <laughs> the code it is four three five four zero nine and then once you've entered that you should see a screen like this one with Mentimeter at the top and it'll give you the option to vote on our questions tonight so we're going to go ahead and do some warm-up questions awesome I see some people are already starting we want to know have you been to a science on tap event before around the size of this one so it should be an easy yes or no you either joined us <laughs> at there? our first event about sea turtles or you're here for the first time tonight all right so it looks like some of us have Started. I just wanted to tell you about a couple other things we have coming up at the museum. I'm going to scoot over so I get on Becca's live stream. Um, so just so you know, in case you didn't already, this upcoming Sunday is World Sea Turtle Day, and we are having an event at the museum. Raise your hand if you have been to the Florida Museum before. Yay! So glad to see that. in the daily life of a loggerhead as it navigates the ocean in search for food. So that's going to be this Sunday from 1 to 4 at the museum. I already know this Sunday is Father's Day. Um, so if you come into the museum and you bring a dad that you know, you get um, buy one, get buy one, get one half off tickets for our butterfly rainforest, which if you haven't been to that, it's beautiful. Um, we also have a new exhibit right now going on called Crocs that actually has live alligators and crocodiles in the exhibit. And that's going on um, for the rest of this year. But um, this Sunday is when you can get the BOGO deal with the dad. Um, and if you want any of these pamphlets, you can pick them up at the table in the back. Um, also, just so you know, our upcoming Science on Tap, um, the next one will actually be in September. And that's going to take place at First Magnitude Brewery. Um, and then October, we'll be back here at Cypress and Grove. So starting this fall, we're going to be doing these programs um, once a month on different topics. Um, and so with that, I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker. Um, oh, actually, before I do that, um, I have these. I forgot I was holding this. So we have um, these awesome pledges that our speaker brought. So it's a seagrass safe voting pledge. Um, and there's some of these in the back corner at her table. And if you fill one of these out um, at some point during the night or during the Q&A, um, feel free to get up. Um, we will do a raffle at the end and we have some cool prizes for you guys. So now I'll introduce our speaker. <laughs> so Savannah is originally from Central Virginia. Um, she received her BS in biology from the University of Virginia while interning with Seagrass Research Team in Virginia Coastal Service. Um, she received her master's and PhD from the University of Florida in fisheries and aquatic services while working on seagrass in the Caribbean and Florida's nature coast. Savannah is currently a regional specialized, um, specialized extension agent 
for the Nature Coast Big Bend region stationed in Cedar Key at the UF IFAS Nature Coast Biological Station. So I think she is the person that knows all the seagrass secrets and <laughs> hopefully she'll share those with us tonight. Um, so before I pass the mic, I just wanted again, thank Savannah and thank Cypress and Grove and all of you for attending. Okay, awesome. This is such a great turnout. I um, had a little internal competition going because the last one was on sea turtles and red tide. And I was like, hmm, I don't know. Let's see if seagrass can bring out as many people. So I think we're getting close. So thanks for being here. And like she said, I'm based here in Cedar Key, so it wasn't too far for me to come. And we don't have any breweries in Cedar Key, so um, this is probably the closest one to me anyway. Okay, so we're gonna um, do a lot of these audience questions and these are gonna mirror the ones that you had on your paper quiz. So if you wanna go ahead and get on the Minty meter. We'll see how many of you already know the secrets. Okay, so true or false? Sea grasses are called the plants that return to the sea because they evolved from land plants. Okay, so it looks like the trues are a little ahead now. There might be a little bit of copying going on there. <laughs> All right, so it looks like most of the votes are in. So let's go ahead and reveal the correct answer so we can test, test ourselves here. Okay, so that is actually true. All right, so seagrasses are evolved from land plants. So I'm gonna ooh, go to my slide that explains that, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> This is why speakers usually don't let the audience participate. <laughs> okay. Actually true plants, there's huge diversity of algae. I did bring an example of some macroalgae on the back table. So have a look at that. Um, but we're going to go a little, into a little bit more later about the differences between algae and seagrass. Um, but al algae actually then gave rise to the true plants. And then seagrasses really did evolve back into the sea. They developed many adaptations to be able to live in salt water in a fully submerged environment. And th these are the lineages of seagrasses. Now, um, I already told you that when we say seagrass, we don't mean algae. But we also don't mean marsh grass. When you're driving out, say, to Cedar Key and you go across that first bridge and you see all those grasses sticking out of the water, that's marsh grass. And the grass that is in your lawn, that's in your yard, is also a true grass. So these grasses are actually different from sea grasses. So a sea grass isn't even really a grass. So um, quite interesting. But they are very specially adapted to live in the, in the ocean. Um, and we'll talk about some of those adaptations in a little bit. Okay, but first I want to get your opinion. So um, there was a quiz question. So if you have the paper quiz, it's probably easier to read, but this question is check all that apply. Um, seagrasses are different from algae or seaweed because seagrass has a vascular system and algae do not. Algae use pigments other than chlorophyll for photosynthesis. Seagrasses are flowering plants and algae are not, and seagrasses tend to form more stable, continuous habitat. All right, pretty good agreement from the group. So we have 50-ish 50, 50 votes and a lot of people think most of these are true. So go ahead and reveal. Yeah, so actually all of these are true. Um, so seagrasses sea have a vascular system. They can actually transport nutrients and carbon and even 
oxygen and other gases through their vascular system and algae do not have that ability. And um, algae have many other pigments that they can use for photosynthesis. That's why there's different colors of algae out there. Um, seagrasses have other pigments in their tissues too, but they don't actually use it for photosynthesis. So that one was a little bit tricky. So some of you guys might've been uh, thrown off by that. And then we'll talk more about this, but seagrasses are flowering plants and they tend to form a little bit more stable habitat than a lot of macroalgae does. Okay, so this is a, a little bit more of detail about what I was just telling you. So algae, when people say seaweed or algae, um, this is what they're referring to as macroalgae. And like, remember, they're pretty primitive in terms of evolution. Algae are great. I mean, don't get me wrong. They're not the coolest plant ever, but that's because they're not plants, remember? So they are still very cool. They have a lot of important services that they provide. Think about kelp forests and things like this. Algae are awesome too. Um, but they actually don't have the ability to transport nutrients through their tissues. So even if you see something like this, where an algae looks like it has roots, it's actually just a an attachment structure. And they get all of their um, nitrogen, phosphorus, carbon, all the things they need to live through direct diffusion from the water column. So it just dissolves straight into their cells and then they use it. Whereas seagrasses are able to access a big pool of nutrients that's down here in the sediment. And when in most aquatic systems, especially the ones where seagrasses thrive, the nutrients in the water column are actually fairly low. And so for them to be able to access the nutrients that are down here in the sediment, that's a great advantage for them. And it allows them to survive in low nutrient environments. With, and when I say that, think clear water environments because they need light to be able to penetrate down. Uh, they are also flowering plants. Their closest um, land relative is the lily, believe it or not. And that's pretty cool. So they don't really like to be mowed. And we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, and they have, they have seeds. Some seeds are floating. Some seeds just tumble across the bottom, depending on the type of um, environment that seagrass lives in. So those are the main differences between algae and seagrass. So now you can know how to correctly refer to these two different plants or not plants, algae are not plants. <laughs> plant looking like things, plant lookalikes. Okay, so we mentioned that grasses are flowering plants. How do we think their flowers are pollinated? And your choices are currents, wind, small underwater invertebrates, or both A and C. So both currents and small invertebrates, like underwater bees. Oh man, okay. This one wasn't so much of a secret, huh? All right, so I think we already know, but it is both A and C. But would you believe me if I told you that scientists only just figured out that it was A and C about two years ago? Yeah. Oh, you already, yeah, I know, obviously you guys already knew. Okay, so seagrass have flowers. They have a very uh, wide variation in how they look. I picked uh, this one to show you. This is the turtle grass, the Lassia testudinum flower. It's probably the most dominant seagrass we have here in Florida. And so they are, you know, quite pretty. This is very zoomed in. I mean, if you've looked at the turtle grass on the back table, that gives you the scale. I mean, this is, you know, no wider than half an inch, but um, they are pollinated a lot by currents. And for a very long time, seagrass biologists thought that was the only way that seagrass flowers were pollinated because who would believe there were the equivalent of underwater bees? That just sounds ridiculous. Until we ha started to have access as researchers to low cost, high quality cameras that are submersible, that can take video of things that are happening at night when we can't observe them. And, you know, of course, our hubris sometimes as scientists is that if we can't observe it, then it doesn't happen. But, um, you know, some people got creative and they got interested in this and they, I'm going to show you a video of this in a second. They found that these seagrass flowers actually can be pollinated by these little guys. And these are amphipods. Um, they're sort of just like tiny shrimp. They're little crustaceans. So I think now we're going to go to the video and this is a shortened version of a video that was on YouTube from the researcher or uh, the lab that originally discovered or proved this phenomenon. So you can go ahead and start it. There's no sound on the video. Um, 
but it's just going to show you some sped up video of all the little things. These are things that are visiting right now the male flower and they're kind of getting this sticky to them and for their pollination and this is a little it's hard to see but that's a um another type of isopod there another type of little shrimp coming and um the big guy um, it, do you want the species name? <laughs> it's, it was, yeah, so the question was, what was the big guy? It was actually an isopod, so it's, a, it's kind of like an amphipod, but it's just got a different, a little slightly different body form. Okay, so then some of those animals then visit the female flowers, and they have pollen stuck to them, and then this video is kind of fuzzy, but it just shows, you know, little freeze frames of little things on female flowers that say, well, this could be pollen. And if you want to see the full version of this video, you can just Google um, like amphipod pollinating seagrass flower and it'll come up on YouTube. And the original researcher is Brigida Van Tussenbrook was, was this lab. So you can, uh, I think that's, yeah. We don't need to watch the whole thing. The original video is like seven minutes long. So I had, I cut a couple pieces out just to show you the highlights, but that's pretty neat. And like I said, that paper was published in 2017 and it was a pretty big deal. I mean, we, um, in the seagrass world, we were like, hey, now we can't tell that joke in our talks anymore about there being no underwater bees. What are we gonna do? Well, now we can show this really cool video, right? So, okay. All right. So. Drilling down a little bit on Florida and the seagrass resources that we have here, where do you guys think, so we're very lucky in Florida, we are seagrass rich here in Florida. We have the two largest seagrass meadows in all of the continental US, right here in our own state. So it's either in the Indian River Lagoon and Florida Bay, in Biscayne Bay and Florida Bay, or the Nature Coast, Florida Bay, or IRL and Nature Coast. So some overlap in our choices. Ooh. We are neck and neck here with C and D. All right, I'm gonna give a little more time. Still got some rolling in. Whoa. Come on, we need the tie to be broken. Okay, there we go. All right, go ahead. All right, so it's actually the Nature Coast and Florida Bay. So we, we are very lucky here in this area. We have access to one of those largest the number one largest is Florida Bay, and the Nature Coast is the second largest here. So, um, say that again. Sorry. So the question was: Was it is it the largest on Earth? I don't know about that because there's quite a lot of seagrass in the Pacific that hasn't maybe been mapped as well as our seagrass here. So, but let's just say for for this uh, area of the world, Florida is is, is the winner. Okay, so this is a map showing Florida's habitat, seagrass habitat, all the green around the coast here is seagrass habitat. So you can see that Florida Bay has huge, huge seagrass resources. And not all of this is continuous, of course. There are some areas that are more patchy, but this just gives you the broad overview. Um, the IRL does have a lot of seagrass. So those of you that, that voted on IRL don't feel bad. It's just that it's quite skinny compared to these long, big shallow areas where there's a lot of light reaching the bottom for a very long expanse out into the water and that's why these two areas really have um, as much seagrass as they do. So we do have six true species of seagrass in Florida and I brought these top three here for you guys to look at. Um, sorry if I can't send them through the live stream to those of you on Facebook but um, turtle grass, uh, manatee grass, and shoal grass are these top three here, and they're our main meadow forming seagrasses here in Florida. They're the ones that really form big expansive areas with turtle grass and manatee grass being the primary um, ones that do that. And then shoal grass is a little bit, it can colonize areas that are a little bit shallower and maybe not as ideal for those other two. And then we have these other three in the genus Holophila, Johnson's star and paddle grass. 
And they are more of, um, they, they're very squat, small, diminutive seagrasses. They, they can form expansive meadows or they can be sort of what we call an understory species where they are sort of are growing underneath the other seagrasses um, and they have lower light requirements than some of the other ones. So go check out and touch and feel, especially shoal grass and manatee grass. They're the most often confused for each other because to your eye, they look very similar. But uh, manatee grass is cylindrical, kind of like a chive or a green onion, whereas um, shoal grass is flat. So that's the main difference between uh, those two. And they also feel very different, but you can confuse them easily just by looking. Okay, so whip out your phones again. Um, seagrass meadows are critical habitat for at least what percentage of Florida's economically valuable fisheries, meaning the commercial and the recreational combined? All right, we're off and running. Okay, so it's pretty clear here. So you can go ahead and show the answer because most people are getting it. It's it's 85%, which is a really great percentage. And so when we say that, um, we mean that it's uh, at least one life stage of some of these fisheries depend on seagrass for part of their life cycle. So um, it doesn't necessarily mean that they spend their whole life in seagrass meadows, but it can be that maybe they depend on seagrasses as the nursery for when they're a juvenile. A good example of that is the gag grouper that we know it's grouper season right now and there's all the big boats. If you're like me and you live out on the coast, all you see is big boats and big trailers heading out to go catch grouper out on the reefs. But those gag grouper actually started their life in a seagrass meadow uh, here in Florida. So um, that's a good thing to know. So, you know, what lies within our seagrass? Well, a whole heck of a lot. I mean, there's uh, a, lot of, a lot of species that depend on seagrass, not just ones that we care about because we like to catch and eat them, but a lot of all the little, you know, a lot of the amphipods that I just showed you, all of those things make up this food web that makes seagrass such a critical habitat that supports all of these bigger fish, fish species that we care about. And I'm also gonna talk a little bit about scallops later and bay scallops are a big, um, a big recreational fishery here in Florida and they depend on seagrasses almost for their entire life cycle. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about them, especially because scallop season opens this weekend in um, at least part of the open harvest area. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about three major services that seagrass provides for us. Um, they really are an amazing habitat. So there's a seahorse here in case you can't see it. Um, that I found that when I was scalloping and then there's just two scallops nestled into the seagrass there. Um, but the habitat value is something that almost universally resonates with people. I mean, without knowing anything about seagrass, you could probably already guess that because of all the structure that it creates, that it's going to be really great habitat. But because it's a rooted plant and because it's fairly um, long lived and persistent, as long as conditions for it are good, it's also fairly stable habitat. And that's a really good thing because that's more reliable and it's more persistent for animals that, that depend on that for generations and generations and generations. Whereas macroalgae is also very good habitat. It's very complex. There's lots of little small spaces for things to hide. Lots of you know, things eat macroalgae, but it is more flashy, more ephemeral. It can bloom and bust. And so that's not as um, maybe stable of a habitat. Some organisms can do well in that, but not as many as can flourish in seagrass meadows. So it's shown time and time again that seagrasses have much higher diversity and abundance of all kinds of organisms than bare sediments um, or, sediment or areas that are intermittently vegetated. Okay, so seagrasses also have um, this really great ability to modify the water flow, namely by slowing it down. So, um, you know, one of the things they do is they baffle the currents. And that causes sediments to settle out of the, of the water column and it makes the water more clear and it makes it prettier for us to snorkel in and scallop in, but it also makes it better for them. So seagrasses are self-reinforcing in a lot of ways and that they, once they get going and there's a nice meadow, they can actually expand their area by 
causing more and more sediment to settle out. They can build up that area and then they can also create conditions where more and more light will penetrate to the bottom so that it supports their photosynthesis. So um, this modification of water flow was a really important feature of seagrasses, but it's also their Achilles heel because if you have seagrass lost from an area, that leaves bare sediment that's not trapped by the root system and it, and it leaves that sediment way more vulnerable to resuspension by winds and waves. And it makes it harder for seagrasses that have been lost from an area to recolonize because they get shaded out more easily from storms and things like that that stir up the water. Okay, so the last thing I'm gonna to talk to you about in terms of major services that seagrasses provide is nutrient cycling. And I'm not gonna go into this too much, but I am gonna tell you that in addition to settling sediment out of the water column, seagrasses also are very effective at taking nitrogen out of the water. And um, they, they shuttle a lot of oxygen down to the sediments. They create micro environments. have to living in this salty submerged environment is that they can shuttle oxygen from that they produce from photosynthesis. Remember plants are producing oxygen. They actually send a certain amount of that to the sediment to and they create a buffer around their own tissues to get rid of that hydrogen sulfide or that rotten egg low tide smell. That's actually a phytotoxin. So if they if they were allowing that hydrogen sulfide to be in contact with their tissues and enter their uh, tissues all the time, they could die from that, but they actually partition some of the oxygen away. And so that creates this great environment for bacteria to transition nitrogen into a form where it's not harmful. We hear a lot about nitrogen pollution in Florida, and this is called denitrification. It's a great service that seagrasses provide. It sounds super boring, but it's actually really awesome. <laughs> Okay, so what is the leading threat to seagrass? We've sort of hinted at it a little bit, but globally and in Florida. So your choices are A, propeller scarring, B, dredging, C, invasive species, or D, declines in water quality or clarity. All right. Someone's been paying attention to the news. <laughs> okay, go ahead. So um, yes, declines in water clarity or water quality are is the leading threat to seagrass in Florida by far. Um, but propeller scarring, so those of you who chose propeller scarring, it's also one of the top three threats in Florida and it's actually a growing threat in the Nature Coast region as we get more and more boating out there, especially during scallop season, our seagrasses are at risk from this and it's sort of a death by a thousand cuts, if you will, but I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, this is a, um, I apologize for that text box that's a little messed up, but this is a, a slide that I took from FWC's most recent seagrass mapping report. And this one here on the left is the trend in seagrass meadows in Florida. So you can see it's actually really great that we have a lot of green dots, which means we have a lot of areas of the state that either have stable or regrowing seagrass meadows based on the mapping reports. Um, but there are also areas that are, um, that are impaired and that we're seeing loss or that have no data. So um, the FWC does a great job in terms of uh, cataloging our seagrass resources because of how important they are to so many fisheries. And in these reports, they also go and look at what were the causes of decline or what are the main drivers so that they can try to address those. Um, and we can see here on this one is sort of looking back at events recently that have negatively impacted seagrasses and we've got bloom, bloom runoff, heat or drought runoff and turbidity. So the, all of them except for the red one are related to some kind of reduction in water clarity. And again, that's because seagrasses need light. They're trapped on the bottom. So anything that blocks light from them is going to make it so they, they can't survive in that area. And they are pretty resilient. They can deal, I mean, they, these species are adapted to live in coastal environments. So, you know, episodic things like hurricanes or a big storm, um, something that disturbs water quality for a short period of time, like maybe even up to a couple months, is not necessarily gonna kill off an entire seagrass meadow that's well established. 
Um, but anything that's going to be more chronic and that lasts longer or is more severe will, especially if it's paired with salinity modifications, like too much fresh water or not enough fresh water, which is um, this one down here, you might be wondering how heat or drought can cause seagrass loss. And that was actually due to hyper salinity. So the water got so salty in Florida Bay that it actually made that hydrogen sulfide be able to form in the water column itself. And it caused what they called the yellow fog of death. And it was self-reinforcing because the more decomposition you had from everything that was dying, the more sulfur you had. And it was like just this yellow toxic cloud, pretty crazy. There's pictures of it online. Um, but anyway, yeah, we all know what algal blooms in Florida look like and, and we sort of covered, covered that already. Um, okay, so propeller scars. Now this is something that I focus on a lot as an extension agent because as extension agents, we try to teach people about the issues that are going on in natural resources and help people learn how to take personal responsibility for things. And I focus on propeller scarring because it's an individual behavior that anyone that drives a boat can help prevent and take a few steps to, to prevent that. And I'll talk about that in a, in a second and it's back there on that pledge. But this is a place right off of Crystal River, right here. This was a drone photo taken by um, one of our uh, videographers that we hired. And um, you can see it's just a crisscross of scars. And that is really not a good thing because it, it can disrupt the root system of the seagrasses and it, it actually can take quite a while for them to heal. Um, so it, a, one propeller scar is not gonna cause huge scale loss of seagrasses, obviously. Um, but when you have something like this, where you have a severely scarred area, you can get blowouts, you can get 